This is Forward Boldly. I'm Christine Niles. Christine Niles, and this is the show where we explore the riches of our Catholic faith and how it informs our daily lives. Tonight, I have with us John Andrew O'Rourke, who's director of a new film out called The Third Way, and uh, Julie Sponsler, who's one of the individuals who's featured prominently in the film. The Third Way is a film that approaches same-sex attraction within the context of Catholic church teaching. It is out now and can be viewed for free at the Blackstone Films website. So first of all, welcome to the both of you to the show. Thanks for doing this tonight. Great to have you here. Thank you, Christine. First of all, congratulations, Sean Andrew, on a job very well done. I thought the film was really powerful, especially the opening scenes. They're really gripping. They really grab your attention. And the film does a really good job of just keeping it there. So great work with that. And I understand Father Hollowell produced the film and you directed um, I was wondering, what inspired you to make this film? I mean, what, what was the genesis of it? What brought it about? Yeah, I've, I've always found that the church's teaching on homosexuality to be really interesting to me personally, um, mainly because I didn't get it. it uh, the church is so loving in so many ways, but then when it came to the issue of, you know, same-sex attraction, it just didn't seem to fit. It seemed bigoted. But, you know, I, I didn't really know what to do with that. It was more of a, a passive thought than anything. Um, and then about two years ago, so in May of 2012, I, we had just, Blackstone Films had just produced a a video that featured Father Hollowell, and he called me up and uh, invited me to lunch and sat down and said, well, I'm a teacher at a Catholic, at a Catholic high school, um, and we need a documentary about the church's teaching on, on same-sex attraction. And I was like, you know what? Great. That, that's what I want to do, because I can approach this as somebody who's interested in the topic but knows almost nothing, and I feel that when I'm in that position, I can produce the best work possible. And so that's, that's kind of where it all started. Now, you actually mm-hmm. founded Blackstone Films, right? That's right. About, uh, about three years ago, I spent six months interning with another Catholic film company in Brooklyn, New York, and at the end of that internship, decided uh, that I wanted to start on my own. Julie, I wanted to turn to you for a moment. Of course, you've been on my show yeah. before. You have a very powerful testimony. And I'm so glad that, you know, you went ahead and did this film. I was wondering, was it difficult for you to kind of get in front of the camera and share parts of your story? And what sort of feedback have you gotten in response? No, I guess it wasn't It wasn't hard. I, I guess I wasn't really thinking at the time. I'm just sitting there with two guys, you know. I wasn't, it wasn't like a whole world of people, so... Now it's kind of a whole world of people. Right. And, uh, well, I've mixed responses. Most people have just loved it and been very touched by it and very moved by it. And it opens their eyes to a lot of things. Some of those people that, that were close to me didn't really realize until they saw the film how just really how they had been impacting me before I disclosed myself to them. And then I've seen some of the comments about the film online, and obviously they just don't get it. Well, for example, some people had written on under the film, you know, they really would like to have seen some gays interviewed who were in good, loving relationships and happy with their life. And it's like, you, you don't get it. That's not right. the point of the movie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's but, been kind of a mixed reaction because, I mean, whenever you, whenever you deal with the subject of homosexuality, especially when you talk about Catholic Church teaching, it's very touchy. I mean, it's going to sure. set off controversy and people are going to have very strong feelings about it either way. But, you know, I think what I like about this film is that it gives you, it puts a humane face on the struggle with same-sex attraction. And, uh, you know, especially for people who may not have friends or may not have exposure to people who struggle with this cross, I think this film does a really good job of exploring, you know, the lives of people who do struggle with this, um, what they went through in the past and how they came to the Catholic faith. 
uh, yeah, let me go. I, I was very impressed with um, the job that Mr. O'Rourke did on the film. I, I thought he did an excellent job in bringing everyone's stories together and piecing it into this one big voice. Right. <laughs> let me turn back to you, John Andrew. So the film is called The Third Way. Okay, so it's not the first way. It's not the second way. It's the third way. What is the third way? Well, basically, um, when we fundraised for the film, we had a different title. and um, Right, it was Unnatural Law. Unnatural Law. And really, what we wanted to do was to draw in everybody. We put Unnatural Law with a question mark to basically say, are we saying the church is teaching us unnatural? Are we saying that homosexual acts are unnatural? Are we saying the law is unnatural? What, what, are, we, what are we talking about? Um, but after we cut together a rough draft of the film and sent it to... Uh, so a couple of respected figures within the church, there were two unanimous responses to it. The first was, this is incredible. There's nothing like it. And the second one was, you need to change the title. Okay. <laughs> and, and at that time, um, what really struck me was that, you know, we, I, was on, I was on vacation at the time that we got that feedback. And I was disappointed because obviously, you know, three quarters of the way through production, changing the title is a branding nightmare. But it really struck me that, there was a title that we could use that actually fit the context of the movie perfectly. Um, and I don't want to give away completely for those who haven't seen the film, why we picked um, the third way or how it fits in. But basically the first two ways are one, what I would call a liberal left, which basically says, act on your attractions, do whatever you want. God wants you to love, just do whatever. Um, and then you've got kind of the really far to the right wing conservatives who say, if you have this attraction, you're going to hell. You're a sinner and you're going to hell. You are unacceptable. And, and the Catholic Church gets often lumped into that second group. Um, even, even with Pope Francis, I feel like the media um, is taking his words to mean that the church is trying to move away from that second group. And the church has never been in that second group. The church, just, the church puts forward a third way. Um, and that third way is that, as summarized in the film, you know, we can't endorse every action that every person does. Um, and that goes for everybody. That's not just homosexuals. That's, that's me. That's you. Um, not everything we do is, is approved by the church. But at the same time, we're not going to say that a person is going to go to hell for what they feel attracted to. Um, and we're not going to hate the person for their attractions. We're going to choose to love them. And so if I could summarize the third way in one word, the third way is, is love. And love involves truth. Say two words, it would be authentic love. And lo authentic love is about truth. Exactly. Because misplaced compassion uh, withholds truth. And really, in the end, it's not love at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, um, Julie, in this uh, documentary is that, uh, you know, at one point when you were still kind of thinking about the gay lifestyle and whether or not it was right to be in it, there were actually Catholic nuns and deacons who were telling you, oh, you're fine. God understands. You can indulge in this lifestyle and you're, you're just okay. Right. And clearly... Yes. This is not the message the film is trying to bring across. No, not at all. At the point when I encountered the nuns, I was kind of on, on the fence. I was coming back to the church. I was going to Mass, not super faithfully, but you know, I, I was starting to feel my way back. But then, And I was also going to the gay church, who had two Catholic nuns there as spiritual directors. And I had gone to talk to one of them at her convent. And you know, she, when I said, well, you, you do know that I'm gay, right? And she waved her hand in the air like she was swatting a fly and said, oh, we get way more hung up on sex than God does. That doesn't matter. And even though she was saying what, what part of me wanted to hear, I I was angry. I, I was instantly angry, and I thought, "You're a nun. You're not supposed to be telling me right. this." <laughs> yeah. And so then I couldn't trust her anymore because I knew she wasn't supposed to be telling me that, you even though a, it was what better, I wanted to hear. You had a better <laughs> grasp of the sensus catholicus than this <laughs> consecrated did. So that, that's 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 really <laughs> unfortunate. I wanted to turn to something because your commentary in the film touches on a, a somewhat taboo subject, controversial subject. Uh, some of the guests discuss uh, what they believe to be the roots of their same-sex attraction. And the common thread in all of them is that there was some sort of deficiency in their relationship with their parents, often with the same gender parent, where there's some kind of coldness, lack of affection. 
And if not the genesis of same-sex attraction, at least it exacerbated it such that some of these, your guests, admitted that, you know, they've tried to find that affection and that intimacy they didn't have in their childhood with people of the same gender later on. I think that this is fairly accepted. It's It's been fairly accepted in psychology for a long time, but it's still a very controversial t- thing to bring up. And it's actually one of the things that Sister Jane Dominic said at Charlotte Catholic High that got her so much trouble. I just wanted to ask, turn to you for a moment, Julie, and ask you, what are your thoughts on that? Because t- I think today the narrative is you're born that way. You ha- There is a gay gene and there's nothing at all that you can do to ever change it. So why not just indulge in it? Just be yourself, be you. That's who you are. Yeah, that's definitely the the prevalent thought out there today. As far as the deficient connection with parents, I know that a lot of people in the gay community really balk at that. And they will be real quick to hand you examples of how that's not true at all. And, and, yeah, there certainly are people in the lifestyle that that scenario does not fit. But they're also in a world now where they're just pummeled with it as being a, a rational choice to make. My own personal experience in the lifestyle, I would have to say that at least 75% of the gay people that I knew were damaged people. They were hurt and they were broken. They had poor relationships with their families, with their parents. They grew up with damaged relationships. They didn't understand how to connect to to people of their own sex and of the opposite sex. And they were alcoholics, drug addicts. They were abused. They were molested. They had all kinds of issues. The majority of the people that I encountered in that lifestyle, as angry as they get when you bring that up, they don't want to face that or they want to blame it on, well, that's because you don't accept us. I want to t- uh, interject when uh, when you talk about that the film was, was definitely laden with people who came from broken background. Two points I want to make about that. One, during the editing process, Father Hollow and I spent a lot of time discussing that and saying, you know what, we're going to get a lot of pushback from people who say, I came from a family that was fine. I am not broken. I am not messed up. How dare you insinuate that every gay person didn't relate well to their opposite gender parent. Um, And so honestly, through the editing process, we actually downplayed that side because we wanted to say it doesn't matter where this came from. The church does not speak about where this came from. In the catechism, it says the psychological genesis of homosexuality is unexplained. So when we're creating a film with the intention of conveying the church's teaching, we're trying to do our best to remain faithful to that. And so really what we wanted to do as filmmakers was not put a statement down that says every person came from a broken family or every person was molested. We wanted to let these people tell their own stories. And we interviewed everybody who agreed to be interviewed. We reached out to everybody we could find, and we interviewed everybody who said yes. And we felt that we did a good job of letting them speak their own part. The film doesn't say, it came from this, and you need to be fixed this way, and we can fix you. No, the film says, you know what, these broken people. And the second thing I wanted to talk about is that, really, we allowed that part to stay in there to some degree, because I think for the average Catholic and I would speak for the average American, but I'm a Catholic, so I can speak better for Catholics. We will often see, and Julie said this really well in the film, we often see the stereotypical homosexual as really in your face and and frankly just annoying. And Julie says it really well that she's like, I'm not like that. I'm not what you think homosexuals are. And that's what we wanted to do, is we wanted to say these aren't people who come from a place of anger and a place of wanting to put something in our face and wanting to impose their lifestyle upon us. No, these are human beings who who don't have it all together and none of us have it all together. So there's definitely a balance we tried to strike between, you know what, a lot of the people we interviewed did come from very clearly broken backgrounds, but at the same time realizing, you know, not everyone does and we want to do justice to that too. Yeah. And I think you did such a great job in, like I said, showing 
a very humane face to those who struggle with same-sex attraction and I think helping to generate in the rest of us who may see kind of the militant, angry, homosexual, you know, parading half naked in the streets and trying to push their agenda on us. And a lot of us are very taken aback by that and get very defensive. But I think with your film, you do a very good job of showing that, yes, they're, they're real people. Some of them are not in your face at all. And they're just trying to struggle through life, trying to find meaning and, and truth and love. And that's what we wanted to bring out, that it doesn't matter where you came from, that you're still a human being and this issue is still very painful. And I would think that if you talk to anybody across the board, whether or not they're in the church, they would say that at some point they have been bullied or been repressed for having these attractions. And we wanted to say, you know what, they're human beings and that hurts them. And that's something that we can't continue doing. We're supposed to be the face of Christ. We're supposed to love we have to always treat our brothers and our sisters with love and respect. And I think, um, you know, when I had Father Check on my show, uh, one of the things that he we both talked about was the beauty, really, of those who struggle with the cross of same-sex attraction being able to unite that cross with the sufferings of our Lord and in that way really strive after sanctity and become saints. I mean, some of these people can become the greatest saints simply by carrying this cross. It's, it's really a film full of hope. Right, because you listen to these people's commentaries, yours, Julie, and then um, you know some of the others there as well. It's very painful listening to the, the terrible things that they had to go through, but in the end, it's very clear that you know you have found your hope and your joy and your fulfillment and your happiness in the Catholic Church, oh, living sure. according to God's commands, uh, a chaste, celibate, faithful life. Yes, I've read comments in reference to the film, and and in other context when the subject of of homosexuality comes up and that we can't act on those feelings and that that's somehow cruel and uh, how could we possibly be asked to not indulge that part of our ourself and I don't feel oppressed in any way I feel free it, it's a wonderful feeling to, to know that I have the love of my life now. When I have Jesus and I have the Virgin Mary and I have all the angels and saints in heaven now, I have the love of my life. I'm not oppressed in any way to walk away from that lifestyle. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so congratulations once again, John Andrew. Thank you, Julie, for your courage and being willing to share your story and help others who may be struggling with the same thing to kind of take a look at the Catholic faith and find their true healing and joy. John Andrew, could you tell listeners where they can find the film online to watch it? Uh, the best way to, to find the film online is actually to visit whatisthethirdway.com, and that'll take you directly to our website where the, where the film is embedded. Best of luck to you. Thanks Thank to the both of you so much for being here tonight. And okay, of course, before we leave, I do have to give a big <laughs> plug for uh, Courage Ministries. It's solid. It's wonderful. Apostle ministers to those struggling with same-sex attraction. I've had Father Paul check on my show before. They're doing some really great work. And uh, for anybody out there who may be struggling with same-sex attraction, who knows people who are, please take a look at Courage Ministries because they, uh, they really, they're very solid and they desire to live their lives in conformity with the teachings of the church and are truly striving after sanctity. So again, that's... That's the Courage Apostolate. You're listening to Forward Boldly. I'm your host, Christine Niles, and we've been speaking with John Andrew O'Rourke, director of the film The Third Way, as well as with Julie Sponsler, who is featured in the film as well. The film is free to watch on blackstonefilms.org. When we come back from our break, we're going to be speaking with Robert Riley, author of the book Making Gay Okay. He's going to give an unsparing look at rationalization of homosexual behavior and how it is turning society upside down and things are only getting worse by the minute. We'll be right back. You're listening to Forward Boldly Radio. Please visit our main page at forwardboldly.com 
where you can learn more about our programming and access all our hosts' archived shows. Our hosts, comprised of both clergy and laity, are all faithful to the magisterium and provide solid commentary on various aspects of Catholic orthodoxy and orthopraxy. The mission of Forward Boldly Radio is to spread the light of the one true faith through online media. And we take our name from St. Joan of Arc, who when riding into battle with the army of soldiers, would hold high her battle standard and cry out, in God's name, Forward Boldly. We hope you'll join us in our mission by sharing our shows, praying for us, and if possible, donating to help offset the costs of running this network. All our content is free. Again, you can find us at forwardboldly.com and on Facebook. Thank you for your support, and in the words of St. Joan of Arc, in God's name, Forward Boldly. host Christine Niles, and today I'm speaking with Robert Riley, author of the recently published book, Making Gay Okay, How Rationalizing Homosexual Behavior is Changing Everything. Mr. Riley has worked as special assistant to President Ronald Reagan. He's also been senior advisor for public diplomacy at the U.S. Embassy in Bern, Switzerland, senior advisor to the Iraqi Information Ministry during Operation Iraqi Freedom, along with a host of other prestigious positions. He's author of a number of books on foreign policy, Islam, as well as music. And today he's here to talk about his book on the homosexualist agenda and how it's changing society for the worse. So, Mr. Riley, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. Delight to be with you. Um, we should make clear at the outset what you yourself made clear in the book, and it goes without saying, you said that this critique of the homosexual cause is not an attack on homosexuals, nor is it generated by any animus against them. Of course, that goes without saying, but, you know, we want to make that clear in case people get the wrong idea. And uh, I, I just want to commend you for publishing this book. It's uh, controversial. It shouldn't be controversial, but it is in this day and age, and it's just gotten rave reviews. So uh, it's, it's taken a bit of courage, I think, for you to publish this. So I, I want to commend you for that. Well, that's very kind of you to say. And it is essential always to make the distinction between judging a person and judging an act. Um, Americans get very confused because they're not that well versed in critical thinking that, uh, and 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 it, some have homosexual friends or members of their family, and they think it's some form of betrayal unless you embrace what they're doing. But we're not called upon to judge other people. That's God's job, not ours. But we are given the ability to discern uh, good from evil in actions. And in fact, it's obligatory for us to use our reason to arrive upon what is good and what constitutes human flourishing. So we can address the moral character of acts. We know that lying is wrong. We know that murder is wrong. We know that sex outside of spousal relations is wrong. And in each of these instances, we can know uh, what's wrong according to what we are as human beings. And that's why I make the argument from reason. There's nothing in my book about religion. I don't quote any scriptures. This is addressed simply from reason. Absolutely. I'd be interested uh, to know, have you gotten a lot of negative backlash from this book? Sure. You know, this may sound too self-congratulatory, but I came across a wonderful quote from George Orwell the other day that said, the more a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. So this is not, what I'm saying is not welcome. As we know, the rationalization for homosexual misbehavior is rolling through the courts, overturning all the state constitutions that had defined marriages between a man and a woman, as well as obliterating the Federal Marriage Act, which had defined marriage that way uh, in terms of federal law. And, and of course, the media is completely taken with this notion of the normative character of homosexual acts, meaning if they're normative, they're moral, they should be sanctified. Uh, homosexuals should become priests and bishops and teachers, and we should all be taught the new norm of homosexual behavior. And if you say, well, wait a minute, 
there's something intrinsically morally disordered in this behavior, and promoting it as moral is in itself a great evil because it's a lie about what human beings are. Exactly. Of course, Oregon has become the latest state, the 18th, to legalize same-sex marriage. And on that topic, I appreciated the, uh, the article that you sent me um, that you just had published called Love in a Time of Re- Unreality. And I just, I think you so succinctly summarize why there's really no such thing as same-sex so-called marriage. I want to read just a short excerpt here because uh, the way you explain it, it's just so clear, common sense, and so succinct. You write here, spousal love is both unitive and procreative. That is what defines marriage and why it is necessarily heterosexual by the nature of what it is. Two men and two women may love each other, but they cannot have a love that is either unitive or procreative, which is why they are not spouses in reality. The only type of love which it is right to express sexually is spousal love because it's uniquely unitive and procreative. Using sex to express the other types of love is a sure sign that it is not love which is being expressed. I think that's and, very clear. Well, thank you. And, and that statement comes from an examination of the purposes, the inbuilt ends of our uh, sexual powers. Just as we can know that an eye is for seeing and an ear for hearing, we can know our sexual organs are ordered uh, toward the unitive and the procreative. And those ends are met uniquely in a spousal relationship in a marriage. And any activity outside of that spousal relationship is a frustration of those ends and therefore a misuse of the sexual powers. Now, you don't have to be Benedict the Sixteenth to figure this out. Uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle all understood this. Aristotle in the politics began with a man and a woman in a marriage as the pre-political foundation of life, the necessary beginning for a village, for a political order, for a city, etc. And he recognized that the, the principle of the family is chastity, because chastity regulates the exclusive sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. And anything that violates that principle of chastity therefore undermines not only that family and that marriage, but the political order itself, which depends upon, for its existence, that pre-political institution of the family. Therefore, Aristotle concludes that chastity is the political principle. Now, he never discussed the possibility of a homosexual family because... uh, the act of sodomy is an act of unchastity, and you cannot have a family based upon a principle which is antithetical to it, meaning chastity. So it's a contradiction in terms. And that's why no one really throughout our history has ever considered such an institution until about 10 years ago in the Netherlands. And I think uh, you mentioned Oregon. I think that uh, the decision by the federal district Uh, court judge, Michael McShane, illustrates how much is lost or how much has to be ignored to embrace homosexual marriage. I'll just read this sentence from his ruling. I believe that if we can look for a moment past gender and sexuality, we can see in these, meaning same-sex plaintiffs, Nothing more or less than our own families, families who we would expect our Constitution to protect, if not exalt in equal measure, unquote. So we're supposed to look past gender and sexuality in marriage. It makes no sense. Families can't exist without the exercise. Uh, They can't be generated without precisely that differentiation in sexuality. So to look past it means to obliterate it. And it's, it is this profound denial of reality that is eating away at the United States, and it's affecting far more than the tiny homosexual population. Let's turn for a moment then to your book, because uh, the first part is titled The Rationalization and How It Works. And you spend some time exploring the influence of Aristotle, how that was eventually replaced by the thought of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And you write here in your book, Rousseau turned Aristotle's notion of nature on its head. 
Aristotle said that nature defined not only what man is, but what he should be. Rousseau countered that nature is not an end, a telos, but a beginning. Man's end is his beginning, or as Alan Bloom expressed it, there are not ends, only possibilities. So for our listeners, could you explain this paradigm shift from Aristotle to Rousseau and how it's contributed to this current rationalization of behaviors that were once universally understood to be unnatural? Right. Well, Aristotle developed the notion of these laws of nature that are constituted by our essence about how we are made, just as we can know the eye is for seeing and so forth. The larger question is, what is man for? And he's constituted for happiness, said Aristotle, which can only be reached through virtue. Now, let's say a popularizer in the 20th century of Rousseau's thoughts, John Dewey, put it rather well when he said man's nature is to have no nature. In other words, a complete denial of Aristotle and the notion that our ends are inbuilt into the way we're made. Here it's saying that we can make of ourselves whatever we will and have the power to do. And that's the huge shift. And uh, what we will is dominated by our passions. And therefore, reason is demoted from the means by which we come to know our purposes and the aims toward which we need to order our lives to a servant of the passions. In other words, reason becomes a tool simply to find out the easiest way to satisfy our passions. And that, by the way, when you ask me, am I uh, vilified for what I'm saying, I, I understand what's happening here. People who have surrendered reason and are dominated by their passions, which passion they think is love, can only understand an opposition to it as coming from another passion, which they then think is hate. That's the only way in what they have left of understanding things. When I try to say, no, no, you don't understand, I, I'm not arguing from any passion whatsoever, but from reason concerning what things are, what is, because we don't get to make up how we're constituted as human beings or how the world is made. It's already made. We simply experience it and try to come to understand how it works and what it's meant for. So if you deny it doesn't have a nature, then, by the way, there are no laws of nature or nature's God. And the philosophical and political foundations of this country evaporate. In fact, in most of these judges' decisions overturning of the definition of marriage, you can see the denial of the fundamental understanding of uh, that there are laws of nature and of nature's God. Because you cannot say that there is a natural right to do something unnatural, right. which is what they say there is. Right. So they're, they're denying... The founders of the United States would be absolutely appalled at this travesty. You know, you also spend some time detailing a number of ancient cultures in your book, examining exactly what their attitude was towards sodomy. And, uh, you know, what would you say to those who, for instance, point to Greek culture to argue that, well, sodomy was embraced and accepted there, and therefore there were some places where it was accepted? Yeah, well, that's a, a very good point. And as you know, I spent some time examining that, particularly in ancient Athens, where there wasn't a word for homosexuality until the late 19th century. And what was accepted only in the upper strata of Greek society was a mentoring relationship between a man and a young boy, which was pederastic. But no one was understood to be a homosexual in the sense that this, when this, this mentoring relationship would end as soon as the youth came of age and he was expected to get married and found a family. So they would have been very puzzled by the whole idea of homosexual. And many of these mentoring relationships, by the way, did not involve sodomy. Sodomy was frowned upon. When Socrates examined this subject, he, of course, had great praise for male friendship and male love, as did Greek society. Socrates said, this is a great good. However, if you sexualize this relationship, that is not a great good. That, in fact, is a great evil. You are really short-circuiting the thing toward which the, fr the friendship is aimed, which is the good and the beautiful. 
and uh, you are demeaning that friendship. So Socrates was unambiguous in his condemnation of, of sodomy. So the whole point, in when I, in these live call-in shows, have been talking with homosexuals or lesbians, I try to make the point that a love for another person, whether it's of the same gender or not, of course, is one of life's great gifts, and there's nothing wrong with it. But if in sexualizing that love, you can meet neither the unitive nor procreative aspects of, of sex, this is nature's way of telling you the love you have for that person is not spousal, and that therefore it's wrong for you to sexualize it. Within families, there shouldn't be, aside from the husband and wife, a sexual relationship or between relatives or between children and adults or between, uh, you know, there are all kinds of other relationships in which love exists laudably, uh, and that to sexualize that love would be a grotesquerie. I think you also make a very good point that the voice of conscience has to be silenced, uh, you know, through not only persistent sinning, but also uh, this proud promotion of, in celebrating of sin. I've got a priest friend who says the same thing, that this aggressive push to legalize same-sex marriage and kind of force everyone else to accept it and even celebrate it is really at bottom an attempt to muffle the voice of conscience. And I, another excerpt I want to read from your book here, you say, um, rationalizations for moral misbehavior work like this. Anyone who chooses an evil act must present it to himself as good. Otherwise, as Aristotle taught, he would be incapable of choosing it. When we rationalize, we convince ourselves that heretofore forbidden desires are permissible. In short, we assert that bad is good. And then you go on to explain that when this goes on for a protracted period of time, conscience essentially becomes obliterated. Yes, and uh, as Aristotle made clear in the ethics, we're incapable as human beings of choosing something that's uh, without presenting it to ourselves as a good. So we deceive ourselves. And the point is conscience usually intervenes. We regret what we've done, we admit it was wrong, and moral order is restored. But if we center our life on a disordered act, um, if we, we, were, we become professional thieves, or say a hitman, then we must construct a rationalization that more permanently obliterates our conscience and justifies our continued behavior. Now, in the instance of male homosexual acts, we then, they then have to justify the act of sodomy and construct a rationalization for it as a moral good. Now, the only way they're secure in that rationalization is if they can enforce it on everyone else. They have to universalize the rationalization. Otherwise, there are sources of potential rebuke that might trigger their conscience and thus deconstruct the rationalization, and they would then have to face the consequences of the character of their behavior. So they, they have to spread it, and they have to silence those who might speak against it or remonstrate with them about it. And as we have seen, in very short order, this has been successfully done with the social institutions in the United States, with the businessmen and the corporations, with the with the Boy Scouts, with many church denominations, and then throughout the government, foisted on the military, promoted by the courts, and now enforced in such a way that we see in a state like California that a young teenager who wants to do something about their homosexual inclinations cannot because it's against the law to receive therapy that might help him. And we know people being punished who don't want to uh, join in commercial activities involved with homosexual marriages because they're Christians or they simply believe it's wrong and they don't want to be complicit in that wrong. And now they're being penalized for, for that. And this is going to get much worse. It's frightening, really. Lies are frightening and enforced lies are, are great evils. And this lie is being enforced on us now. So... Yeah, actually, the only institution in American society left that is willing to speak this truth and uh, preserve the truth about marriage and human flourishing is the church. Right. And therefore, it is the object of tremendous derision and obloquy and criticism. Yeah. You're listening to Forward Boldly. We are speaking today with Robert Riley, author of the book Making Gay Okay. 
in the uh, second part of your book, it's titled Marching Through the Institutions. And I want to turn for a moment just to the Supreme Court. Of course, as we know, in 1986, the Supreme Court upheld a state anti-sodomy law in Bowers v. Hardwick. And it said explicitly that the Constitution does not confer a fundamental right to engage in homosexual sodomy. And Chief Justice Berger wrote a concurring opinion examining what he called the ancient roots of prohibitions against homosexual sex. He even quoted William Blackstone, who said that homosexual sex is an infamous crime against nature, worse than rape, and a crime not fit to be named. And of course, we know 17 years later that case was overturned, but it's almost mind-blowing to think that at one point we had public officials who could write that, whereas today, if any, but any Supreme Court justice were to write that, people would be screaming for their heads. I mean, they, they would well, say he's a, a we, bigot. We and, uh-huh. Yeah, in, in the dissenting opinions to Windsor about a year ago is what declared unconstitutional the Federal Marriage Act, defining marriages between a man and a woman. You can listen to Justice Scalia and and some of the other justices in their dissenting opinion objecting to this. But in in fact, it's the same justice writing in the Lawrence decision as writing in the um, the Windsor decision, who who first found a right to sodomy in the Constitution and then found a right to that as the basis of marriage or other homosexual acts as the basis of marriage. And we know is what I try to show through the chapter on the court decisions is the logic that has worked its way up to Justice Kennedy in those two decisions, beginning with Griswold versus Connecticut in the 60s, when the court found that there was a right to contraception for married couples. They needed a prescription, but they could get it, followed by another court decision saying, we can't simply restrict this to married couples. All adults right. have Eisenstein a right to contraceptives. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, another decision saying, well, children have rights, too. We can't deny them contraceptives. So now anybody can have a contraceptive. That, of course, was followed by the decision overturning all the laws against abortion, because why should anyone be penalized? Because their contraception failed. So it's okay to kill the unborn child. And then, of course, we, in tandem with this, had the decisions or the, and the changes in laws on marriage, so no-fault divorce and fast increase in the number of divorces and serial polygamy, basically, uh, leading us ultimately to the Lawrence decision in which uh, Justice Kennedy found this putative right to sodomy in the, in the Constitution disguised under the right to privacy. And then, a decade later, saying... If this right really is okay, if you have a right to to engage in homosexual acts, well, why can't they be the foundation for marriage? And so he answers, they can be. And therefore, the federal laws discriminating against them uh, must be unconstitutional. So there we are. And Justice Scalia, as usual, in his dissenting positions, can predict exactly what's going to happen next. And in Windsor, he said, This now is going to be the basis for obliterating all the state laws and state constitutions defining marriages between a man and a woman. And almost on a daily basis, we see this now taking place. Oregon, Pennsylvania, Utah, one after the other, the federal district courts say, your state constitution is unconstitutional because of this. And also, Justice Scalia predicted, and this has already come partially true, in Utah, that uh, there are no grounds for denying polygamy. And and already there's been a federal district court judge regarding Utah's laws against polygamy and declaring them partially unconstitutional, which is particularly ironic because Utah wasn't allowed as a state in the Union without incorporating in its constitution a prohibition against polygamy. So this is, we're, we're just, all of this is logical. It's almost inevitable in its logic. It's just the premise is insane. Exactly. Polygamy will definitely be the next domino to fall. I think most of oh, us yeah. saw that, but uh, in the beginning, people said, oh, no, that's not going to happen. But And polyandry also. Sure, sure, yeah. absolutely. Uh, you had some interesting things to say as well about the American Psychiatric Association. And, uh, you know, you noted that in 1973, 
Homosexuality was removed as a disorder from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, where it had been in place since 1952. And uh, you basically show that this was not a move based on scientific evidence, but rather on pressuring and lobbying by gay activists. Could you unpack this for our listeners who may not be familiar with this? How did the gay agenda win such a victory in the APA? Well, it won such a victory for several reasons. Number one, there were closet homosexuals within the organization working for these changes. In fact, the president-elect of the American Psychiatric Association at the time was himself a homosexual, as his granddaughter later revealed in uh, some rather stunning radio interviews, which I quote in the book. Homosexual psychiatrists and psychologists who may have wished to see this change nonetheless objected to it because it was not made on the basis of any science or research, that it was done through sheer political muscle. Therefore, they abhor the change because they say this traduces science. This is not science. We don't take a vote on whether uh, something's a disorder or not. We look at the, we look at the research in order to determine it. And that, of course, is not what was done in this case. They were targeted by the homosexual movement, which explicitly said, we're not going to be able to obtain our so-called rights if this can be defined by psychiatry as a psychological disorder. Therefore, we have to overthrow this decision. And they succeeded. But it had absolutely nothing to do with science. Right. Let's turn for a moment to to your thoughts on the U.S. military. Of course, you, you know, in your advisory positions, and of course, you've been in the military, you have kind of a bird's eye view of what's going on there. And you talk of the queering of the military. You know, I wanted to bring up with you a recent study that revealed that I believe sexual assault cases in the military doubled in the last year, at least the reports of them, and that the greatest number of them was actually male on male sexual assault. So do you believe that that's one of the consequences of repealing don't ask, don't tell? And, and could you also talk just a little bit about how you see this, uh, the homosexual agenda making headway in the military? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, you have to ask yourself why for a couple of centuries and more in the military code of justice, sodomy was uh, prohibited and outlawed. Uh, and considered prejudicial to good military order. Why was that so? Why, why uh, Why did George Washington throw out of the Continental Army an officer convicted of sodomy? Well, I, I, as you pointed out, I'm both a veteran. I served in the military, and I've also worked with the military later in life. But I had another experience. In fact, after I got out of the military, I was a professional actor in New York. So I saw the homosexual subculture operating there openly and saw how it worked, uh, what its rules were, how it, how it um, recruited and uh, dispensed its favors. I, I wasn't shocked by this. Any group looks after its own. It's that how they defined their own was defined in terms of their homosexual behavior. In fact, I left one theater after a season being told, Bob, it's too bad you're not a homosexual. You're a good actor. It's too bad you're not a homosexual. Wow. Because you would have gotten, you know, better roles here. But again, I wasn't shocked. Those were the rules of the game there. However, having been in the military, I I know what deleterious consequences would occur if you let that homosexual subculture operate openly in it. And that's what President Obama has achieved by revoking the don't ask, don't tell legislation, which allowed homosexuals to serve as long as they didn't act homosexually or openly espouse it. So I was fine with that compromise. What's what's the problem? It doesn't allow the subculture to openly operate and therefore create this underground homosexual preference, which is prejudicial to good military order. Now that's over. Now it's operating openly. And, of course, it's, it's to inject sexual tension in the military, particularly in a combat unit, is insane. Yeah. And, and that is what this is allowing. Uh, this is why, by the way, the strongest opposition to, to allowing this came from the Marines, who often end up in the most intense combat. So it, this is, what it demonstrates to me is that 
homosexual movement won't stop at anything to universalize its rationalization. If it's going to affect the combat effectiveness of our military, well, that's too bad. That's just part of the price. Just as the spread of their propaganda in primary schools and even kindergartens, one might, well, you know, won't they stop at the innocence of children? No, nope. that's just simply one of the prices for the universalization of this rationalization. It's, right. it's very grim, and nothing, and that is why the church uh, had better get ready, because it's going to get a lot, lot rougher for it. Yeah, I think uh, for you and me, it just seems like such common sense. Uh, in the military, you, you mentioned the intensity of the combat environment, and if you just think they're already in a pressure cooker situation, the testosterone is through the roof, sort of has to be, and you include, you know, sexual tension into that. It just doesn't surprise me that there are so many more reports now of male-on-male rape in situations like that. Right. Well, excellent book. I commend you once again for writing it and publishing it. And I was wondering, could you tell our listeners where they can get ordering information for your book? Yes, thank you so much. You know, of course, you can go to the Ignatius Press website and order it directly from there. Or, of course, it's available on Amazon and, you know, any number of other Internet book sale sites, or, and it should be in quite a number of stores because Ignatius Press has very good distribution. And again, I would just simply urge your listeners, if, if they need to know what the rational arguments against this are, this is what I dedicated the book to, to equip them with those. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciated speaking with you today. Thanks for being on the show. Good luck. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you. You've been listening to Forward Boldly with Christine Niles. Remember that you can find more about our network and access all our archived shows at forwardboldly.com. Please also check out our podcasts at the Regina Magazine blog, found at blog.reginamag.com. Okay, my friends, keep fighting the good fight of the faith. And in the words of St. Joan of Arc, in God's name, Forward Boldly. Thank you.